what's goody what's good what's good <clears throat> yo i'm so glad y'all are here again this one's going to be on the mystic americanism okay or or the spiritual heritage of america revealed now this of course going to be from the works <clears throat> of rs climber y'all know what's up y'all know i like this book why do i like this book because i'm the one who uploaded it to the internet in its full entirety i found this thing at an amazing estate sale <laughs> and, and this thing here y'all when i talk about has got the drops i'm telling you right now go look it up on archive if you want your own look in the details i'll have the link for the copy in which i uploaded this has got so much drop for y'all and a lot of people don't realize it but there's so much drop and it's maybe it may be hard for some to see initially um but when you really get in here and start to understand what's going on you can see where the secrets you know are, are told where they have um where they kind of just go through everything itself but what i wanted to kind of touch base on initially was the america aspect um because now that we've been touching base at least on this last series in relation to atala right an old world name for america atala okay um in the aspect that we had a tribe that was in there known as the eddie eddie guys eddie guys right and we also got the ale 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 gawi ale ale gans el el right the l in there okay um we have the Atalans and the Kutans, right? So as we start to understand who these people were that actually were the mound builders, the tribes, the civilizations, the people um, that were before the invasion of the Okhuzians and the Mengui, um, we had so much war and everything kind of just transpiring. So, I mean, there's just so much that we can go over. But I did make some videos actually on these maybe two three years back that i ended up pulling down from the internet just because i felt as though some of the images that i was putting up in relation to the reading were just not accurate they were actually uh really not accurate and so by continuously absorbing knowledge and information uh, i'm not even going to put some images maybe i might put some here and there but i think if we just go through this together you can just sit and listen lay down wherever you be in your car driving at work in the gym this is for you this is for you and it's uh empowering to keep moving forward and learning as we're learning and um i want to give a big shout out to uh 432 the drop another big shout out to my boy Karameo. hey man i appreciate you both y'all are amazing so let's get going America was not by accident. In the pursuit of our spiritual heritage, we are guided by the words of uh, Dr. Paschal Beverly Randolph. And if you don't know who Paschal Beverly Randolph is, he is uh, uh, sort of the individual, uh, maybe ruddy, if you want to say, who was the founder of the Rosicrucian Society here in America. Okay. Um, there is a chronology of soul as well as of material history. Okay. And further as we read on in his pre-Adamite man, which we haven't touched base on. We will. Y'all don't trip. Every nation under heaven, our own beloved America especially, has a buried history as well as a living one recorded on paper and in human memories. Nothing greater or more important could have been said in regards to the antiquity of ancient America, which is to follow on these pages, helping to explain the ancient American civilizations and their places in the drama in the heavens. So here we go. <clears throat> America. It has generally been supposed that the name America originated with the name Amerigo Vespucci, but a further analysis reveals its Scythian origin. And the fact that it's three syllables. Um, Ari, Ka, conceal a word trinity, expressive of the entire Aryan cycle and of the deity itself. Now, in the first syllable, Am, um, is the masculine, Am, um, of the Egyptians. The last syllable, Ka, gives us an ancient feminine form. Between these two pillars, 
male and female, behold the race, Ari, main stem of the descendants of Noah, Scythians of pure Aryan, Japhetic stock, ancestors of the Anglo-Saxon races, as well as all others that have led in modern civilizations. In fact, the origins of the twelve tribed Israel, souls in evolution since the flood, the mystic Celts. Do you understand how much drop is right there in that in which so many people get confused on? Om is the masculine. Ka is the feminine. Between those twin pillars, you ever seen the pillars on the Masonic Lodge? Male and female. Okay, sun and the moon above. Okay. Behold the race. Airy. Airy. Main stem of the descendants of Noah. Scythians of pure Aryan. Japhetic stock. Ancestors of the Anglo Saxons. Saxony. Have you been able to get your understanding on what Anglo Saxons are? The sons of Isaac? Saxony. <laughs> as well as all others that have led in modern civilizations. In fact, the origins of the twelve tribed Israel. Souls in evolution since the flood, the mystic Celts. Do I need to go over to Godfrey Higgins? Do we need to go read about the Celts? According to Godfrey Higgins, someone that's going to keep it real. Someone that's not highly noted for their work because it doesn't work but it's so extensive that it goes beyond most work in the first place. Check it, we moving on. From Noah, we have the three Aryan races. Who said that they was different? Because they all Aryan. How do we get to a point where they became different? Because right here it says, Shem, who was partaking of both Japhetic and Hamitic characteristics, meaning that he was of the same of both Japhetic and Hamitic characteristics. Very clear to see. There's not much there to conjecture on. And most easily traced by the rock teaching of moral purity. Moral purity. Being pure. In relation to the most high and understanding Hawa. From Abraham by Keturah. Now we're starting to get into <coughs> analogies. Things of that nature. Right? We start moving around. Who are we referencing? What are we talking about? Goes out of colony to India. Which India? We talking about India superior? And by Hagar and Ishmael to Arabia. By Sarah, the Japhetic Aryan. Begins his return westward through Isaac. Uh-oh. There we go again. And Jacob. And the twelve nations of Scythian or Scot races. To take up the thread of Noah, Japhet, Og, Eolos, and the line from Armenia marching westward to Spain and named by the Iberia, Eber, from an Iberia left behind at the Black Sea. Back up. We're taking it back a little bit. Marching westward to Spain and named by them Iberia, Eber, from an Iberia left behind at the Black Sea. C. These records are quite plain in the Irish Chronicles of Dr. O'Connor. It was at Ulster, at Tara, Mount of the Rock of God, Western Altar in refuge of the race, as Ararat had been to Noah, that the line began to converge. Here, Atikati, original Atlantean colony, received the invading Dan. We know who the Dan be now. The, the, the Danite, who in turn, but to no avail, fought back the Milesian Scots from Armenia and Spain, and little Ur, orphan son of Seir and grandson of Gollum, William, was given the throne of Ulster. Here were received the Picts and other lines from Troy and Carthage and stranger Hittites and Philistines. At last came Jeremiah, renewing the rock teaching in bringing the line of Judah, the coronation stone, and the princess. The name Eri 
prevailed in descendants of Ur down to the migration to Scotland, the loss of the coronation stone, and the royal line of David. Who we talking about when we talking about David, huh? Neprete. Hence the name Erie, or what they want to claim here, Ireland, seems set within America, regardless of claims of Mexico or Canada to rights to the name, possibly because these are remnants of ancient Atlantis and are living proofs of the completion of the great Aryan cycle in America, which is Atlantis rising again. Who? Boy, these drops. Races come and races go. Civilizations rise and fall, but the souls of Aerie go marching on. Hmm. Now, moving on to a later part in the work on page 25, we draw on the side of the veil of antiquity in America, the mound builders and their works. An ancient and unknown people left remains of settled life and of a certain degree of civilization in the valleys of the Mississippi and its tributaries. We have no authentic name for them either as a nation or a race. Oh, what? <laughs> what? Yeah, that's I, I don't get that because, uh, yeah, we've already, we just did some of that with the Rafineske. So we have no authentic name for them either as a nation or a race. Therefore, they are called Mount Bailders. This name having been suggested by an important class of their works. Yeah, of course, because they wasn't just mounds. There was pyramids. There was Teocallis. We just went through this. Okay. Prominent among the remains by which we know that such a people once inhabited that region are artificial mounds constructed with intelligence and great labor beyond anything in relation to what the Indians was out here doing in relation to what they kind of said, you know, TPs, everything they kind of promote. So prominent among the remains by which we know that such a people once inhabited that region are artificial mounds constructed with intelligence and great labor. Yes, we know this. Most of them are terraced and truncated pyramids. There we go. In shape, they are usually square or rectangular, but sometimes hexagonal or octagonal, and the higher mounds appear to have been constructed with winding stairways on the outside leading to their summits. What? And the higher mounds appear to have been constructed with winding stairways on the outside leading to their summits. Many of these structures have a close resemblance to Teocales of Mexico. Yes, because they were. They differ considerably in size. The Great Mound at Grave Creek, West Virginia is 70 feet high and 1,000 feet in circumference at the base. A mound in Miamisburg, Ohio is 68 feet high and 852 in circumference. The Great Truncated Pyramid at Cahokia, Illinois is 700 feet long, 500 wide, and 90 feet in height. Generally, however, these mounds range from 6 to 30 feet high. In the lower valley of the Mississippi, they are usually larger in horizontal extent with less elevation. Now, figure 2 represents the Great Mound of Miamisburg, Ohio, which may be compared with a similar structure at Mayapan, Yucatan. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Similar structure at Mayapan, Yucatan. Figure 3 shows a square mound near Marietta, Ohio. There have been a great many conjectures in regard. Okay, so boom. Look at that. The Great Mound near Miamisburg. Mm-hmm. So, you know how much sea used to probably rain over that thing, man. It's crazy. And here's the next one. Look at that. Look at that, bro. Oof. Square Mound near Marietta. Beautiful. Just beautiful. Okay. So we got these two. For which these mounds, to the purposes for which these mounds were bent, some of them rather fanciful. Yeah, they were designed very nicely. Of course, they got destroyed too because they didn't want everybody to know what's up. We find it most reasonable to believe that the mounds in this part of the continent were used precisely in the same structures were used in Mexico and Central America. Yep. I mean, that would be a safe assumption due to the fact that we is the oldest here in America. Then we pushed down further south and built even bigger and greater things. But it originated from up here and even further north. We, uh, let me see where we at. The lower mound, or most of them, must have been constructed as foundations of the most important edifices of the mound building people. I just want to start, when he say mound building people, 
I just want to start saying Atalans, Alagans, you know, uh, the Kutans. From my research, that's how far back we are. Um, for show, for show. But I don't know, we're we going to keep going. Many of the great buildings erected on such pyramidal foundations at Pelinque, Uxmo, and elsewhere in that region have not disappeared because they were built of hewn stone laid in mortar. For reasons not difficult to understand, the mound builders beginning their works on the lower Mississippi constructed such edifices of wood or some other perishable material. Therefore, not a trace of them remains. Mm. Interesting, due to the fact that in other instances such as Raffineske, we have instances showing that they were made of sun-dried sun brick. We got even more references in earlier works that we've done, saying it's straight sun-dried brick. The higher mounds, with broad flat summits reached by heights of steps on the outside, are like Mexican teocalis or temples. In Mexico, uh oh, we'll wait here. To fully understand the people of yesterday, yesterday, one must continually keep in mind that their religion was a living religion, and that all they did, they did for it in demonstrating their love and recognition of the Creator. I gotta read that again, y'all, because that's what we've stopped doing. That's the problem that we got. We quit looking at the creator. We start looking within ourselves so much, the material aspect. We, we quit giving so much insight to the great creator, Hawa. Let's read that again. To fully understand the people of yesterday, or the, our ancestors, one must continually keep in mind that the religion was a living religion. They lived it. They breathed it. They understood that every breath they took was the body of Hawa. That when they ate, they ate from the body of Hawa, for we live within Hawa. And that all that they did, they did it for the demonstrating their love and recognition of the great Hawa. In Mexico and Central America, these structures were very numerous. They are described as solid pyramidal masses of earth. There we go. Cased with brick or stone. Cased with brick or stone. Level at the top. And furnished with ascending ranges of steps on the outside. They don't talk about that. They just say mounds, the mounds, the mounds. Why do they keep saying mounds if we got brick? If they cased with brick and stone, bro. Like, what y'all talking about? These ain't no mounds. They true structures. and furnished with ascending ranges of steps on the outside. The resemblance is striking, and the most reasonable explanation seems to be that in both regions, mounds of this class were intended for the same uses. Here, figure four, works of the Cedar Bank of Ohio. Look what it says right here. So we got Cioto River, okay? We got Cioto River, right? Now check it, it says 700 feet to one inch. Okay, that's the scale here. Look at this, y'all. This is 32 acres. That's 32 acres right there. Within that space, that's 32 acres. That's a town. That's a city. That's a big city. Right there off of the river, they at the top. Look at the top of that. Then they got the ridge, the bank, the valley. And then you got the Seattle River. 32 acres. Come on now. Y'all watch out. Don't let it be fooled, man. We was really doing this. <laughs> Okay. Shows the work at Cedar Bank, Ohio, enclosing a mound or a pyramid or a structure. I'm so tired of the word mound. The structure within the enclosure is 245 feet long by 150 broad. Figure five shows a group of, of structures in Washington County, Mississippi, some of which are connected by means of causeways. Another class of these antiquities, this is, these are so old, y'all. You have no clue. Another, and they've been under the sea. This is what you can tell about them. They are so old and under so much strata. That means soil on top, soil accumulation. That we, these was once under the sea, under the water. Another class of these antiquities consists of enclosures formed by heavy embankments of earth and stone. There's nothing to explain these constructions so clearly as to leave no room for conjecture and speculation. Look at that. Look at that. Where's this at, y'all? 
And what's that look like? Works in Washington County, Mississippi. That looks just like Central and South America. This is the beginning of everything South, y'all. How many times do I got to keep saying this? North America is the original. The original to everything further South. And it wasn't your Iroquois. It wasn't your Chickasaws. Okay? <laughs> These aren't the people who built this. They will tell you that. It has been suggested that some of them may have been intended for defense. Others, again, it has been suggested. That don't mean that's what it is. So when people say they know that's what it was for, don't dodge it. Other for Others for religious purposes. Okay, everybody just throwing their conjectures out there. A portion of them, it may be, encircled villages or towns. Mm, 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 that seems more probable, doesn't it? Doesn't it seem more probable? I mean, that makes logical sense to me. Look how huge these are. You think they just built these for nothing, man? This was the beginning of it all. In some cases, the ditches or fosses were made on the inside and others on the outside. But no one can fully explain why they were made. We know only that they were prepared intelligently with great labor for human uses. Asterisk. These, or footnote, these designs utilized herein with, were with definite purpose. It was a monotheistic religion as only one creator or deity was worshipped. Hawa, to which they gave many attributes, each attribute having a symbol assigned to it. Okay, so all the time when we talk about our Native Americans, you know, it's tying these symbols into astrology or, or stars, and people try to tie that in, uh, like our ancient symbols to stars or astrology or they gods that they just duplicated and replicated because we already had it in place. You have to dodge those hijacks, y'all. You have to understand right here, like I said, we as a monotheistic religion has only one creator or deity. Hawa was worshipped to which we gave many attributes. Each attribute having a specific symbol assigned to it. So if there's similarities between these uh, other people's gods or astrology gods or anything like that and they're similar just know and understand that that was that was all an attribute given to the great Hawa there were lines of embankment varying from 5 to 30 feet in height and enclosing from 1 to 50 acres are very common while enclosures containing from 100 to 200 acres are not infrequent so enclosures from a hundred to two hundred acres are not infrequent you understand that think about think about the labor that goes into 200 acres of an enclosure <sighs> bro like what and occasional works are found in closing as many as 400 acres <laughs> you just blew my mind bro like what are you are you kidding me 400 acres and occasional it wasn't just one or two it was occasionally figure six and seven give views of the hope works hope four miles north of chilecote ohio combinations of the square and circle are common in these ancient works and the figures are always perfect this perfection of the figures proves, as Squire and Davis remarked, that the builders possessed a standard of measurement and had a means of determining angles. Angels. Uh-oh. About 100 enclosures and 500 mounds have been examined in Ross County, Ohio, alone. The number of mounds, or should I say structures, in the whole state is estimated at over 10,000. And the number of enclosures at more than 1,500. The great number of these ancient remains in the regions occupied by our pyramid builders, our Atalans, our Kutans, our Alagans, our Eri, is really surprising. They are more numerous in the regions on the lower Mississippi and the Gulf of Mexico than anywhere else. And here, in some cases, sun-dried brick was used in the embankments. 
Now, I want y'all to just think for a moment. I want you in your mind just to think about if you was going alongside the Nile. And the Bible talks about all these wars and these towns and these cities and just everything that's happening along the Nile River. The Nile is so, it's involved all throughout the history. Where is all of, where is everything? Where is all the structures to this day? Where's all the artifacts then? Where's it all at, y'all? Y'all tell me. But then again, over here in America, like the Mormons be saying, I'm not a Mormon, bro. I'm just backing up, like looking at what they got, like what they got actually backs up what's in the soil. It was in the strata, like what's evident out there, like how much more logical can it get? I know we've been told something our whole lives, <laughs> but I mean, proof is in the pudding. Where am I putting that? Where am I putting that? It's right here on the Mississippi. We're the real fertile crescent right here in the Gulf, man. Where it's all popping off, you dig? Here we go again. There are more numerous in that regions on the lower Mississippi and on the Gulf of Mexico than anywhere else. And here, in some cases, sun-dried brick was used in the embankments. Sun-dried brick was used in the embankments. We want y'all want to start talking star forts. Mm -hmm. Who really? Whose whose structures are those really? One peculiarity at the South is that while the enclosures are generally smaller and comparatively less numerous, there is a greater portion of low mounds, and these are often larger in extent. Harrison Mound in South Carolina is 480 feet in circumference and 15 feet high. Another was described as 500 feet in the circumference at the base, 225 at the summit, and 34 feet high. In a small mound near this, which was opened, there was, we'll go back up to the asterisk, hold on, there was found an urn holding 46 quarts and also a considerable deposit of beads and shelled ornaments very much decomposed okay so we're coming back up gotta read this footnote outstanding in the pattern of symbols used was the circle which was conspicuously embodied in sacred ceremony signifying not only eternity but the presence of both in one and all in one i am you and you is us i am you and you is we and we is us all a part of the great i am that's all day man come on y'all it's beautiful all right so let's rotate this i want to look at this bad boy with y'all real quick all right let's see what we got going on so this is works at Hopetan, Ohio. Look at that. Look at that, y'all. Look at how symmetrical everything was. Look what they was doing, man. The magic, the ceremony, the structures. Just amazing, man. So this is in Ohio. You can just tell how old this really is. All right, so check this one out. This one's uh, 700 feet to one inch as far as scale is concerned. This is the uh, principal figures of the Hopaton works. So we got a 20 acre embankment right here with a circle perfectly lined up. Then we got another 20 acres here lined up. Just amazing. Look at this alleyway. Dang, man, it's crazy. All right, so let me see. So where are we at? Broad terraces of various heights, mounds with several stages. Structures, should I say, elevated passages oh, and long avenues mm -hmm. and aqueducts or artificial ponds are common at the south. OK, we're making our own ponds around here. You dig figure eight shows the remains of a graded way of this ancient people near Piketon, Ohio. At Seltzertown, Mississippi, there is a mound or structure 600 feet long, 400 feet wide and 40 feet high. The area of its level summit measures four acres. The area of its level summit measures four acres. There was a ditch around it, and near it are smaller mounds. Mr. J.R. Barlett says, on the authority of Dr. M.W. Dickerson, quote, The north side of this mound is supported by a wall of sun-dried brick. <laughs> 
Tell them. Tell them. Sun dried brick, bro. We had it over here. We originated that. You dig? Ah, watch out now. Okay. Let's see what it says. Two feet thick, filled with grass, rushes, and leaves. Unquote. Okay, so we're going to come back up. Look at that. Ooh. Yeah, we built that. Yeah, we built that. Watch out now. <laughs> Piked in a while. Graded way. Okay. Dr. Dickinson mentions angular tumuli with corners, still quite perfect, and formed of large bricks bearing the impression of human hands. Mm, beautiful. In Louisiana, near the Trinity, there is a great enclosure partially faced with sun dried bricks of large size. We ain't talking about no small itty bitty. We're talking about that large size. And if it was so large, that means there had to be technology to move it. And in this neighborhood, ditches and artificial pounds have been examined. In the southern states, these works appear to assume a closer resemblance to the this is mound work, but structure work of Central America. Okay, this is amazing. The result of intelligent exploration and study of these antiquities is stated as follows, quote, Although possessing throughout certain general points of resemblance going to establish a kindred origin, a kindred origin, going to establish a kindred origin, these works nevertheless resolve themselves into three grand geographical divisions which present in many respects striking contrast yet so gradually merge into each other that it is impossible to determine where one series terminates and the other begins unquote think about how much migration was taking place y'all our people stayed in the sun like we moving with the animals bro we ain't staying around and getting cold man we moving that's another big problem that we got these days we ain't moving where the sun going we ain't staying with with the life giver on the upper lakes and to a certain extent in michigan iowa and missouri but particularly in wisconsin the outlines of the enclosures elsewhere more regular in form were designed in the forms of animals birds serpents and even men appearing on the surface of the country like huge relievals the embankment of an irregular enclosure in adams county ohio is described as follows by squire and davis Mr. Squire having made the drawing of it for the work published by the Smithsonian Institution. But what really amazes me is the aspect that you got to think about this. If they're making these big structures like that, what they making the big structures for? Who's seeing those? What kind of flying do we got going on? See, the thing that they really got us messed up in our mind is we really think that these people were like super primitive. If I go and show you some like real artistic works um, from some things that I have as far as describing how they were. I mean, just look at their clothes, for instance. Their clothes at that time was even way more intricate than they are now as far as a lot of the clothes that we wear and possess to this day. They really got our mind thinking that these people were primitive. And that's because they really tried to teach us and train us that everything was just evolution. That's where we really got messed up at is that we when we look back at these people, we really think of them as like barefoot, you know, barely any clothes scampering around, you know, like this is not it, just look at the aspects of Central America and understand how intricate that is. And really, really look when you dive deep and understand that this was beyond what you can even really fathom. And it was really tied into nature. A unification or harmony was understood about nature. Now it's all about technology. Quote, it is in the form of a serpent upward of a thousand feet in length, extended in graceful curves and terminating in a triple coil at the tail. The embankment constituting this figure is more than five feet high with a base of 30 feet wide at the center of the body, diminishing somewhat toward the head and the tail. The neck of the figure is stretched out and slightly curved. The mouth is wide open and seems in the act of swallowing or ejecting an oval figure which rests partially within the distended jaws. This oval is formed by an embankment of four feet high and is perfectly regular in outline. It's transverse and conjugate diameters 
being respectively 160 and 80 feet. The combined figure has been regarded as a symbolic illustration of the oriental cosmological idea of the serpent and the egg. But however this may be, little doubt can exist of the symbolical character of the monument. <laughs> oriental, you say, eh? <laughs> Where's the original Asia Major? Where's the original Asia, huh? Watch out, man. So we got a footnote. We'll get to that, though. Figure 9 gives a view of this work, and we all know about it. But it says, no symbolic device is more common among the antiquities of Mexico and Central America than the form of the serpent. And it was sometimes reproduced in part in architectural constructions, of course. One of the old books giving an account of a temple dedicated to Quetzalcoatl says, quote, it was circular in form and the entrance represented the mouth of a serpent opened in a frightful manner and extremely terrifying to those who approached it for the first time. Unquote. Now, on the Ohio and its tributaries, and farther south, where the structures are numerous, the enclosures have more regular forms. And in Ohio and in the Ohio Valley, very, off, very often their great extent has incited speculation. And we'll pause there and come down to this footnote real quick, right? Now it says, from time to time, the uh, mound builders, I hate saying it, uh, mound builders built their edifice with no doubt as to its inference and meaning. The serpent mound is one example. The serpent with its tail in its mouth represented eternity, never ending, always existing. The great work now looks to the interpretation of Moses, wherein it was used as a symbol of vitality. When on its belly, sex used in degraded form, it was the symbol of degradation or degradation and betrayal. Uplifted or raised, it symbolized the renewal and life freedom from vile disease, regeneration, and salvation. C. Race Regeneration, The Mystery of Sex and the Mysteries of Osiris, this publisher. So, what's, what we'll be seeing here is that when the snake's on its belly in any of your art, we understand the aspect of sex used in degraded form. Then if the snake is anywhere uplifted or raised, it symbolizes the renewal of life freedom from vile diseases, regeneration, and salvation understand now what you see when you're looking at that art and you see the snake in the position okay boom at newark ohio when first discovered they were spread over an area more than two thousand or two miles square and still showed more than 12 miles of embankment from two to 20 feet high and here of course we got the great serpent adams county just amazing right Got the coil coming from the existence, the ever moment of the mother, the great mother, manifesting, finding its way, trying to seek until it gave life. It's amazing, man. Just amazing. Okay, so let's keep going. Further south, farther south, as, stayed, as already stated, the enclosures are fewer and smaller, or to speak more exactly, the great enclosures and high structures are much less common than low truncated pyramids and pyramidal platforms or foundations with dependent works. Passing up the valley, it is found that Marietta, Newark, Portsmouth, Chilicote, Circleville, Ohio, St. Louis, Missouri, and Frankfort, Kentucky were favorite seats of the great Atalan, Kutan, Alagane, Alegawi. Okay, this leads one to the of the most intelligent investigators to remark that, and he says here, most intelligent investigators. Okay, these people ain't finna come out and just say anything, man. These people are highly, highly regarded to at this time period. This leads one of the most intelligent investigators to remark that the centers of population and now where they were, where, when the mysterious race of the mound builders existed. There is, however, this difference. The remains indicate that their most populous and advanced communities were at the south. Figure 10 shows a fortified hill in Butler County, Ohio. Among those who have examined and described remains of the mound builders, Maziers, Squire, and Davis rank first in importance. Of course they do. Because they have done most they have they have done most to give a particular and comprehensive account of them. 
Their great work, published by the Smithsonian Institution, must be regarded as the highest authority, and those who desire to study the whole subject more in detail will find that work indispensable, of course. Extent of their settlements. Careful study of what is shown in many reports on these ancient remains seems plainly to authorize the conclusion that the mound builders or structure builders or our great people, Atalan, Kutan, Alagane, Alawegui, Atlanteans, boy, entered the country at the south and began their settlements near the Gulf. Ooh, so what are we talking about? Poverty Point. I'm starting to talk about Poverty Point. New Orleans, what's up? Let's read that again. Careful study of what is shown in many reports on these ancient remains seems plainly, easily. You hear that? Plainly. Come on, man. We know this. Come on. To authorize the conclusion. We're authorizing conclusions around here. So all that talk about they came from the north. Uh, well, that might not. Or they came from, uh, they came from Fusa, or they came from uh, China, or anything like that. Nope. What's it say? They in, it plainly to authorize the conclusion that our mound builders entered the country at the south and began their settlements near the Gulf. Uh oh. Here. I'll wait. I'll wait. I'll wait. Let's read the footnote first, y'all. So archaeological history reveals in its excavations the presence of worlds upon worlds. And there, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know what that means, right? That means strata upon strata. That means layers upon layers. That means civilization on top of civilization. That means millennia upon millennia upon millennia. That's what that means, bro. Why? Because first to rise from the depths of the ocean is America. Louis Agassiz, Harvard professor. My mind goes straight to, again, Yellowstone. National Park, super volcano, largest in the world. I'm going to leave it at that. Continuing, and there is no shortage of instance after instance, <laughs> see, you see what I'm saying? Where this has been found. Niven has discovered three civilizations buried one beneath the other. Look at that, y'all. Uh-oh, your boy's getting validation with strata of sand, gravel, and boulders between them. Heavy floods, heavy floods, mass cataclysmic actions, lots and lots of glaciers. Do you understand? Uh, we're looking at that ice wall around us now and thinking that's the only place it's been. It's been in other places across the larger landmass of the plain in which we live. We're not on this floating ball, y'all. There's more lands out there. If you don't believe me, go look up Vibes of Cosmos right now. Leave me and go look up Vibes of Cosmos and start watching some documentaries. And really understand what's going on. This has been known for a long time. The moon is a plasma phenomenon, y'all. Y'all gotta catch up. Y'all gotta catch up. Okay? These cities are more than 1,000 feet above sea level. <laughs> With mountains... Of from 5,000 to 15,000 feet in altitude, intervening between them and the sea. Big exclamation mark because it's a big drop. These cities are more than a thousand feet above sea level at that time. Do you really understand how much water there was now? Hmm, what was flooded? Where was Noah's flood? Where was the flood of Plague? Wake up. They talking about the cradle of civilization is China because of why? Civilization began again there? Again? Reset there? I mean, what do you want me to say? George W. Rank, a Kentucky historian, wrote, quote, The city of Lexington is built of the dust of the dead metropolis of a lost race, of whose name and language history not a vestige is left, unquote. Mm, mm, mm. 
Sounds really similar to America, man. Let's go. So this bad boy right here is a fortified hill in Bunker County, Ohio. All right. Look at how this works out. Look at this. This is leading out to some water. Look how they have this. This is for crops. This is for animal. I mean, for uh, livestock. Okay. Got a dug hole, it says. Stone over here. We got stone structures. And this right here says 56 acres, y'all. It's huge. It's huge. They must have been very numerous while their works at every point on the limit of their distribution north, east, and west indicate a much less numerous border population. Remains of their works have been traced through a great extent of the country. You gotta imagine how much more is just underground. They are found in West Virginia. They are found in West Virginia and are spread through Michigan, Wisconsin, and Iowa to Nebraska. Lewis and Clark reported seeing them on the Missouri River, a thousand miles above its junction with the Mississippi. But this report has not been satisfactorily verified. Uh oh. Appreciate you keeping it real. They have been observed on the Kansas Plateau and other remote western rivers. It is said they are found all over the intermediate of the more southern country, being most numerous in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Missouri, Arkansas, Kentucky, Tennessee, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, and Texas. This ancient race, who we talking about? The Atalans, the Croutons, the Alagans, seems to have occupied nearly the whole basin of the Missouri and its tributaries with the fertile plains along the Gulf, and their settlements were continued across the Rio Grande into Mexico. But toward their eastern, northern, and western limit, the population was evidently smaller, and their occupation of the territory less complete than in the valley of the Ohio. And from that point down, to the Gulf. No other united people previous to our time can be supposed to have occupied so large an extent of territory in this part of North America. No other united people previous to our time can be supposed to have occupied so large an extent of territory in this part of North America. So stop acting like all these people came from other places and did this that is not what's up y'all need to stop y'all's guesswork is flawed it has heretofore been stated that remains of this people exist in western new york but a more intelligent and careful examination shows that the works in western new york are not remains of the mound builders Okay, so check it. Uh-oh, you got New York. You got people over here in New York building something, but it's not related to the mound builders. And then they want to try and say, oh, well, it relates. Because these people from somewhere else may have built those structures that now it relates to the mound builders. It does not stop. This is now the opinion of Mr. Squire formed on personal investigation since the great work of Squire and Davis was published, their civilization. It is usual to rank the civilized life of the mound builders much below that of the ancient people of Mexico and Central America. It is usual. It is usual. Why? 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 Because that's how they want it. It's an agenda. It's made to be that way. Now he says this may be correct for the remains as they now exist appear to justify it. But if all the ancient stonework in Central America, with its finely carved inscriptions and wonderful decorations, had disappeared in the ages before Europeans visited this continent, the difference might not appear to be so great. You hear that? Now, I think logically in my mind, knowing that about 11,000 years ago from the work that they got done doing off of the Younger Dryas floods and the aspect that we had Canada all the way coming past the U.S. and Canadian border was under a mile of ice, would lead me to believe that it was so cold and inhabitable for our people in that region to stay that they continued to move further south and develop greater and greater things. Wouldn't that make logical sense? For then the Central American remains consisting only of earthworks, truncated pyramids, pyramidal foundations, and their connected works made of earth would have a closer resemblance to the works of the mound builders to those especially found on the lower Mississippi. On the other hand, if we now had in the Ohio and Mississippi valleys remains of the more important edifices anciently constructed there, 
the mound builders, mound builders might be placed considerably higher in the scale of civilization than it has been customary to allow. You hear that? But what ended up happening? They've taken everything, man. They've taken everything, man. How many sarcophaguses was found here in America and taken over there, man? How many? It can be seen without long study of their works as we know them that the mound builders had a certain degree of civilization which raised them far above the condition of savages. There is a clear distinction between savages and these people. Stop co-mixing them. They are not one and the same. Not even close. To make such works possible under any circumstances, there must be settled life. With its accumulations in an intelligently organized industry, fixed habits of useful work directed by intelligence are what barbarous tribes lack most of all. A profound change in this respect is indispensable to the beginning of civilization in such tribes. Now, who do we know was the most barbarous? The Osages, the Mingui, the Iroquois coming down here and causing all this strife, running away from their own battles, their own wars and their own lands, coming down here and disrupting our people and what they was doing. Right. Cool, cool, cool. So we go on. So no savage tribe found here by Europeans could have undertaken such constructions as those of the mound builders. Back it up. Taking one more back one time. No savage tribe found here by Europeans could have undertaken such constructions as those of the mound builders. The wild Indians found in North America lived rudely in tribes. They had only such organizations as was required by their nomadic habits. Who are we talking about? We're talking about the Okuzian tribes, y'all. And you know who the old Kuzian tribes are. Those the Mongols, man. Y'all quit playing with me, man. And I'm sorry I got to keep it real. If that offends you, it is what it is because the history is there to, to prove it and back it up. So we ain't going to play with that no more. We going to keep it real, bro. We ain't here to be kind. We here to be real. I'm sorry if that hurts you. Get offended if you won't. I'm not here to be politically correct. I'm here to speak up for the truth. I'm here to stand up for Hawa. And their methods of hunting and fishing. So let's come back up here on the footnote. The general theory among orthodox science. Okay, yep, here we go. The general theory of mainstream understanding is that man came up from a brute beast to a savage. And from savagery traveled on by degrees until he reached civilization. But that's not how it went, man. So y'all need to stop. We are creations of the creator. Y'all back up and get off the hijack. And everything that was created here was created for us because we are the image of the great Hawa. We do not stand alone when we say that it was highly possible that savagery. We do not stand alone when we say that savagery or that it was highly possible that savagery came out of civilization, not civilization out of savagery. Do you hear me? Why? Think about that deeply. Think about that deeply. It is only those who are not aware of the savage who maintains that civilization has emerged out of savagery. Oh, I love it. We get deep. Y'all better start thinking around here. I'm here to provoke thoughts. These barbarous Indians gave no sign of being capable of the systematic application to useful industry which promotes intelligence elevates the condition of life accumulates wealth and undertakes great works such as our ancestors this condition of industry of which we of the worn and decayed works of mound builders are unmistakable monuments means civilization albert gallatin who gave considerable attention Attention to their remains thought their works indicated not only a dense agricultural population, but also a state of society essentially different from that of the Iroquois and Algonquin Indians, right? So who are the Iroquois and who are the Algonquins? The Oghusian tribes, Mingui. 
He was sure that the people who established such settlements and built such works must have been eminently agriculture. They weren't hunters, y'all. We's out here eating the fruits. We's out here eating the crops. We wasn't eating meat. What does that sound similar to? Not to eat any meat. <laughs> I'm leave it there, y'all. No trace of their ordinary dwellings is left. <laughs> These must have been constructed of perishable materials, which went to dust long before great forests had, again, covered most of the regions through which they were scattered. Doubtless their dwellings and other edifices were made of wood, and they must have been numerous. It is abundantly evident that there were large towns and places as Newark, Circleville, and Marietta in Ohio. Figures 11, 12. 11 and 12 give views of works on Paint Creek, Ohio. Their agricultural products may have been similar to many of those found in Mexico. And it is not improbable that the barbarous Indians, who afterward occupied the country, learned from them the cultivation of maize. Their unity as a people, which is everywhere so manifest, must have been expressed in political organization, else it could not have been maintained. So you understand that we had lords, governors, mangoes, cons. We had a systematic political society and organization nowhere else manifest within anything that was found here when any Europeans or anybody else came it was totally different so much land mass had changed and it was because of the floods and we're going to come back up here to an asterisk a savage left to himself does not rise <laughs> He has fallen to where he is and is still going down. It is only when he is brought into contact with civilization that an upward change in him becomes possible. The savage when brought into contact with civilization does one of two things. He either absorbs civilization and rises or he absorbs only the vices of civilization, adds them to his own savage vices, becomes more brute-like and falls still lower. Such are doomed to early extinction. Wow truth so check this one out this one's one of the larger ones y'all right based off of paint creek and this is in uh, paint creek oh, uh, valley ohio and this is a structure that was built on uh, uh, over 140 acres amazing beautiful okay so in the details of their works and in manufactured articles taken from the mounds, there is evidence of considerable civilization. For instance, it has been ascertained. And let's switch this around real quick as well. We'll get this rotated for everybody so we can get a good good view here on what's going on. So this is works on North Fork of Paint Creek as well. Different structure. And look at this. Again, another 111 acres, y'all. Okay. <laughs> Just amazing. So if we got Frankfurt... It says road from Chilecote. So, of course, they had roads, paved roads, y'all. Okay. All right. So, let's come back up here start off with the sentence again. So, for instance, it has been ascertained that the circular enclosures are perfect circles and the square enclosures are perfect squares. They were constructed with a geometrical precision which implies a kind of knowledge in the builders that may be called scientific. <laughs> figures 13 14 15 16 show some of the more important works of the mound builders chiefly in ohio relics of art have been dug from some of the mounds consisting of a considerable variety of ornaments and implements of made of copper silver obsidian porphyry and greenstone finely wrought there are axes single and double adzids chisels drills or gravers lance heads knives bracelets pendants beads in the like made of copper. There are articles of pottery, elegantly designed and finished, ornaments made of silver, bone, mica from the Alaganes, uh-oh, and the shells from the Gulf of Mexico. The articles made of stone show fine workmanship. Some of them are elaborately carved. Tools of some very hard material must have been required to work the porphyry in this manner. Obsidian is a volcanic product largely used by the ancient Mexicans and Peruvians for arms and cutting instruments so we'll come back up 
This is an amazing piece of work right here. Squaring the circle. <laughs> Look at it, perfectly due north. Look at that, y'all. Just amazing. This is eight acres. Look at that circle based off of eight acres. Do you know how hard that is? <laughs> Do you know how hard that is, y'all? That is not easy. So this elliptical work near Brownsville, Ohio. So it is found in its natural state nowhere near the Mississippi Valley than the Mexican mountains of Cerro Gordo or Gordo. There appears to be evidence that the mound builders had the art of spinning and weaving for cloths has been found among the remains. Do you hear me? Uh-oh. So that's what I'm talking about. We really had clothes. I'm not talking about like, we ain't talking about like uh, like little things ho hanging over our, our uh, genitalia areas, y'all. We talking about full-on fledged clothes, robes, headpieces, dresses. They, they tried to make it seem like we wasn't having all this up here with their depictions. That's why if you go look up the anything in relation to mound builders, uh, mound builder society, um, you want to look up anything in relation to, let's just say, look up, go search Cahokia. You're going to find these mounds all based around uh like let's say like mud okay with like these oh, you know little huts and things like that why aren't they showing the sun-dried brick why aren't they showing the aspect that we are very closely related and tied to central and south america in relation to the style of building but also not only the style but also the material being used why 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 At the meeting of the International Congress of Prehistoric Archaeology held at Norwich, England in 1868, one of the speakers stated this fact as follows, quote, Fragments of charred cloth made of spun fibers have been found in the mounds. Fragments of charred cloth made of spun fibers have been found in the mounds. Stop with your hijack. It's over with, y'all. This is known in 1868. What happened? The uh, Rockefeller Foundation made uh, kindergarten through 12th grade. That's what happened. A specimen of such cloth taken from a mound in Butler County, Ohio, is in Blackamoor Museum in Salisbury. <laughs> Blackamoor Museum, of course. Of course. In the same collection are several lumps of burnt clay which formed part of the altar so-called in a mound in Ross County, Ohio. Mm. Altars, altars, uh-oh. To this clay, a few charred threads are still attached. Figures 17 and 18 represent specimens of vases taken from the mounds. So check this out. Whoa, whoa, you're talking about strong engineering skills here. Strong engineering skills. There's a side, you know, I mean, just logically think here, y'all. Logically think. This is works near Liberty, Ohio. So this large circle up here on the right-hand side is 40 acres. Okay, and this is road from Chilicote to Richmond, I can't tell, and Jackson. This right here, this square alone on the left-hand side is 27 acres. And then you got this right here at 800 feet in diameter. Just amazing. I mean, it's ridiculous, y'all. Mr. Schoolcraft gives this account of a discovery made in West Virginia. Quote, antique tube, telescopic device. <laughs> in the course of excavations made in 1842 in the easternmost of the three mounds of the Elizabethtown group, several tubes of stone were disclosed. The precise object of which has been the subject of various opinions. The longest measured 12 inches and the shortest 8. Three of them were carved out of steatite, being skillfully cut and polished. The diameter of the tube externally was 1 inch and 4 tenths. The bore, 8 tenths of an inch. This caliber was continued till within 3 eighths of an inch of the end, sight end, it was diminished to two-tenths of an inch. By placing the eye at the diminished end, the X light is shut from the pupil and distant objects are more clearly discerned. We had telescopes, bruh. Did you hear that? We had telescopes, bruh. Go look it up. 
right here. Mr. Schoolcraft. Go look this up. These are the terms you want to look up. Mr. Schoolcraft. Antique tube telescopic device. In 1842. You probably will find it. Okay. Probably some pictures. Probably some accounts. We're just going to read through this right now. But that might be something we need to check out. This embankment right here. The rectangular work of Randolph County in Indiana. You can see the elevation of its works here. Look at how the engineering is. Look at that. Okay. So this covers 31 acres. And there's clearly structure directly in the middle. How big that was, we'll never know. <clears throat> so we're going to be reading this uh, footnote here. Do I have one up here? Let me check. Okay, now we good. All right, so the four-sided square is the third of the three of the first three symbols that were used in man's religious teachings. I symbolized the earth. The four corners represented the four cardinal points, north, south, east, and west. At each corner, a keeper was assigned. All of these three sacred symbols are found carved on stones of the South Sea Islands running and among all ancient peoples. These symbols were universal. Also called soapstone. This is where we're talking about the steatite. Okay. A variety of talc, talc of a grayish green or brown color. It is found in extensive beds and was quarried for hearths and coarse utensils. Now here we can see some vases of the mounds itself. Doesn't necessarily say, um, it says figures. Oh yeah, so it's not saying which specifically region that these was found in though. But still beautiful nonetheless. Very intricate. Um, let's see. So he points out that the carving and workmanship generally are very superior to Indian pipe carvings and adds, if this article was a work of the mound builders intended for telescopic tube it is most interesting relic an ancient peruvian relic found a few years since shows the figure of a man wrought in silver in the act of studying the heavens through such a tube you want to know what they talking about <laughs> they talking about those inca stones y'all now i ain't covered the inca stones because they've been hit so hard with tales of fabrication and the reason they've been hit so hard with tales of fabrication is because they're so unbelievably beautiful and so hard to fathom um, that they've just been de uh, distinct. They've been put out there in the world as frauds and fakes, y'all. That's what they've done, right? But maybe we'll have to bring up that Inca Stones. I briefly brought it up on my Instagram, so we'll see how that works out, all right? So it says, similar tubes have been found among relics of the mound builders in Ohio and elsewhere. In Mexico, Captain Duplois saw sculptured on a peculiar stone structure the figure of a man making use of one see this is the one i'm talking about right now y'all astronomical devices were sculpted sculptured below the figure this structure he supposed to have been used for observation of the stars his account of it will be given in the chapter on mexican and central american ruins now the mound builders used large quantities of copper such as that taken from the copper beds on lake superior where the extensive mines yield copper, not in the ore, but as pure metal. It exists not in those beds, in immense masses, in small veins, and in separated lumps of various sizes. The mound builders work this copper without smelting it. Spots of pure silver are frequently found studying, studying the surface of Lake Superior, copper, and appearing as if welded to it, but not alloyed with it. No other copper has this peculiarity, but copper with similar blotches of silver have been dug from the mounds. It was naturally inferred from this fact that the ancient people represented by these antiquities had some knowledge of the art of mining copper, which had been used in the region, copper region, of Lake Superior. This inference finally became an ascertained, ascertained fact. So I don't want to make this one too long. We're going to stop it here. We're going to leave off on their ancient mining works. This is not the only book that can tie in a lot of the understanding of what's going on here in America. But you ever think you would be able to find all of this information in relation to who these people was in a Rosicrucian book wrote by Dr. R.S. Clymer called Mystic Americanism? <laughs> no. This is where they hide the secrets, y'all. 
I told you I love this book. It's one of my most favorite books. And um, yes, yeah, it's wrote by Doctor R. S. Comma. Lo and behold. So, anyways, yo, man, uh, we're gonna keep dropping. We're gonna keep coming with it. Uh, I'll probably start reading some more of this here soon. We'll get part two popping off. So, love y'all. Peace and blessings. You dig? Ah, we dodging all hijacks. I love it. All right.